all for joining us this morning for the release of this report. Uh, my name is Stapleton Roy. I'm the director of the Kissinger Institute here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, could I ask Michael Van Dusen, the acting director of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, to say a few words of welcome. Thanks, Dave, and uh, welcome to all of you. Um, the Woodrow Wilson Center is the official national memorial to the 28th president. Um, being the only president we ever had who had a PhD, he always felt uh, that you have to bring, get scholars out of their ivory tower and understand the practical problems of governance, and you have to get policymakers away from their inbox where all they can think about is a meeting next <coughs> Thursday to think long term. Um, that's precisely what we're doing today. Uh, we're getting the private sector scholars policymakers in the same room to discuss uh, a, uh, an issue of concern, uh, of interest to everyone, an issue that we need to get right. Uh, I want to uh, make a special word of welcome to Ambassador Zhang. Good to have you here. And um, uh, greetings to all of you from Jane Harmon, the President and CEO of the Center, who unfortunately is in California today. Uh, on a trip that was uh, planned many, many months ago. Um, two, we are a public-private institution, which I guess is important to say, getting roughly one-third of what keeps this place going through a federal appropriation, but raising two-thirds. Two and a half years ago, the Center uh, created um, the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States uh, to try and work on um, and contribute to a better understanding of this crucial bilateral relationship. Um, we think this report being issued and launched today um, makes a significant contribution to that objective. I want to thank the Asia Society and uh, uh, Dan Rosen and Tilo Hanneman for their uh, work on this event as well as uh, STAPE and uh, Sandy Foe on uh, his staff. Um, I uh, uh, note that um, Chinese investment is beginning to flow in the United States <coughs> in significant amounts, and it's very important for the United States to understand uh, the implications. At the end, I noted of the executive summary the United States and China are at a turning point in their economic relationship. In the future, China will invest sums abroad as vast as those that foreigners continue to place in China. How well the United States adjusts to this sea change will have a profound impact on its economic interests in the decades ahead and set the tone for the larger U.S.-China relationship. That tees it up very well. I hope you have a good morning. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, well, thank you, Michael. Uh, my name is Orville Schell, and uh, I'm the director of the Center in U.S.-China Relations to the Asia Society. And I do want to, uh, before we begin, uh, thank all of our partners, uh, Kissinger Institute, Rhodium, uh, Ogilvy, uh, who's helped us with you, the press, uh, and also uh, 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 a consultancy uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Monitor, who did a very interesting series of interviews with U.S. CEOs about how they look at this issue. Um, let me just very quickly uh, tell you one or two things about why we did this report. I think any of us who've been in China uh, of late have a, uh, increasingly clear perception that there's a lot of very sort of fundamental ways in which the relationship between our two countries uh, is changing. Uh, this manifests itself in many ways, depending on what area of endeavor you are in. But one of the most striking ones, I think, is the way in which the, the river of foreign direct investment, which traditionally we never thought about it, it went from west to east, from developed country to developing country. And that, in fact, is changing. And the question then uh, arises, how should we, who are so used to exporting capital uh, to the underdeveloped or the developing world, how should we deport ourselves towards this change when China and other countries come 
and start buying companies here, building companies here. And I think we're not, uh, we're, we're incompletely adjusted to that idea. And thus, there's a lot of political static that tends to arise when these things happen, which is not to say there are no national security risks, simply to say that we do need to be clear about where they begin and end so that we can maximize our interests, as this uh, report, I hope you all have a copy, uh, tries to, to, to highlight. And so we undertook it uh, with uh, Dan Rosen and Tila Hahnemann, and we hope you will find it interesting. We hope it will uh, serve to both uh, improve the investment climate between the two uh, countries and indeed the relationship between the two countries. Because unless we can, I think, find a way to be as open to Chinese capital as we are to other forms, again, with the caveat of national security issues uh, being uh, considered, uh, I, I think we, we will suffer. And so that is the subject of what uh, brings us uh, here today. Now, uh, our partner, uh, the Kissinger Institute here in the Wilson Center, uh, is headed by State Roy. And State, maybe you have a few comments you'd like to make as well, and then we'll get into a presentation on the report itself. I'll just add a few uh, remarks. If you look at foreign direct investment in the broad sweep of history, you find that it's inherently controversial. In fact, most countries, for most of modern history, have not welcomed foreign direct investment. It's a relatively recent development, uh, bunched up in the last 30 years, in fact, where foreign direct investment has begun to play a major role in global uh, economic relationships. The United States has had an ambivalent relationship to foreign direct investment. Uh, for much of our history, we did not welcome foreign investment and had barriers against it. And we forget that our railroad system, however, was built largely with British capital. But in the last 30 years, the United States has turned around on this question, as has most of the rest of the developed and developing world. So that now we are not only a major source of foreign direct investment around the world, but we're also a major recipient of foreign direct investment. The purpose of this report is to try to provide an informed basis for potential controversy that can arise as China shifts its global posture from being a net absorber of foreign direct investment to a major provider of foreign direct investment, which is the trend that has begun to emerge in the last few years. It is not good to have an issue of this importance discussed on the basis of poor understanding of the facts and the background. And therefore, I think we owe a real uh, debt of thanks to the authors of this report because they have brought together the best factual basis for understanding both the positive aspects of Chinese foreign direct investment in the United States and the potential risks that always exist uh, in foreign direct investment in advanced countries. So uh, I would now like to turn the floor over to uh, Dan and Tilo, who will run us through the report quickly until uh, Secretary of Commerce uh, Gary Locke is able to be here. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here uh, with you this morning. Thank you so much for uh, joining us for the release of this study. Uh, I would like to start off by saying that what you're about to see uh, would not be before you if it weren't for the uh, vision of Orville uh, Shell uh, and Stape Roy uh, in uh, encouraging my colleagues and I to put together our early stage thinking uh, about the, what we perceive to be a takeoff, a change in the patterns of Chinese investment around the world and in the United States, to pull that together in a way that policymakers 
business people, and the general public can make use of now before the issue becomes more complicated than it is presently, and it will become more complicated in the near future, to put some information on the table that people can use, we all can use, uh, <coughs> to have a more intelligent conversation uh, about China's uh, emerging uh, new uh, enthusiasm as a direct investor around the world. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through the results uh, of, our, of our work on this topic with you uh, for the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, so first, uh, the takeoff. Uh, there's a lot of debate today uh, about what the United States might do when the time comes uh, that Chinese direct investment starts to take off. Um, as you'll see in the next few minutes, we're, uh, uh, we perceive that the takeoff is already occurring. It's not a question of if in the future. It's a question of what's happening right now, why it's happening. In many ways, China is already a heavy hitter uh, in the global economy. The chart behind me shows you some of the metrics that describe China's weight in the global economy today. Of course, 21 percent or so of all the people on Earth. Uh, GDP that's moved back toward a balanced weight uh, against that population weight, you know, still less than 10 percent of global GDP, uh, but that's dramatically greater than uh, in the uh, just recent past. In terms of global exports and import flows, uh, similar to China's GDP weight, uh, around 8 percent on average. And of course, in terms of uh, foreign, uh, foreign uh, exchange reserves, China is uh, by far the largest uh, in the world at almost 30 percent of the forex held by uh, governments around the world are held in China. But on the topic we're here to look at today, outward direct investment, you'll see China is still un very much underweight uh, its size in the world economy. The uh, light blue, uh, the dark blue line third from the left there, China's outward FDI flows represent only about 3.5 percent uh, of global FDI flows uh, today. So while China has become a giant in many ways, in terms of outbound foreign direct investment is not one of them. By the way, what do we mean by outbound foreign direct investment? There are two um, components of that. Mergers and acquisition, when Chinese firms buy Ameri uh, American or other firms uh, abroad, or greenfield direct investment, when they build a factory uh, from scratch, from the ground up. Those are direct investment. Uh, purchasing stocks and bonds, treasuries, agency bonds, that's portfolio investment. China's already quite uh, a, a, a bigger uh, investor in American treasuries than they are in, term, in direct terms, as we'll see um, in just a second. So uh, while China's coming from a position of, of really not even being in the game as a direct investor, you can see on this slide China's global footprint as a direct investor. Until the mid-2000s, there really wasn't anything uh, happening uh, from China at all. And then after 2004, 2005, that starts to change on a global basis. And you can see here in blue, the blue bars are the stock, which means what's the total accumulated value of Chinese investment abroad builds up over time. And the red line, which relates to the left-hand scale there, shows how much the annual increase in that total stock is. So, wow, that's a very dramatic picture, isn't it? Something changed in the mid-2000s, and China's behavior as an outbound investor uh, uh, was altered. In fact, what changed was that China went from being able to meet its resource needs domestically to encountering gross domestic product growth so great and so uh, material intensive that it had to go out and find uh, bauxite and aluminum and iron ore and more oil uh, all over the world, and its companies started going out and becoming direct investors in natural resources uh, to be part of that industry rather than just relying on imports. So this early takeoff in China's outbound investment is very much a raw material, a natural resource um, story. Uh, and uh, while many people interpreted that from, a, say, a Washington or a European perspective as a sign of strength, I personally saw it as a sign of vulnerability. <laughs> And, uh, 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 and in some ways weakness, that China, like the United States now, would forever be dependent on natural resource imports from around the world. That in fact we were starting to have similar kinds of global uh, resource uh, dependency <laughs> profiles rather than the past pattern where China mostly was able to uh, address its basic material needs at home. 
While that takeoff in China's outbound investment started in the mid-2000s, as China's so-called super cycle growth kicked into high gear, in the United States, uh, that story uh, didn't show up. Uh, and the reason, of course, is that the United States is not a big oil exporter uh, or other natural resource exporter. And so while we had extremely large Chinese portfolio investment uh, in U.S. Uh, treasuries, the large blue bar you see there, and in agencies, Fannie Mae, these sorts of things in purple there as well, you see over on the right-hand side of my slide, China's uh, official direct investment position in America as late as 2009 was, according to our Bureau of Economic Analysis, the BEA, using what's called BOP, or Balance of Payments Measurement, only $2.3 billion. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Uh, the uh, portfolio investments China has here, 700 times greater than the direct investment position. Uh, it just wasn't part of the story as seen through uh, a BOP measurement. Uh, look at that compared to the other uh, nations and regions that invest in the United States. Europe is the biggest, by far, uh, chunk of direct investment in America at over 60 percent of it. Within the Asia-Pacific region, uh, which is about 16 and a half percent, almost 12 percent of that 16 is Japanese alone. China really shows up as next to nothing, less than one-tenth of one percent of foreign direct investment in the U.S. as measured uh, by the balance of payments. And for many observers, that might be where the story ends. What more do you really need to know? This is not an issue that serious policymakers should be thinking about today, right? Well, it turns out wrong. Uh, what Tilo Hahnemann, my co-author at the end of the table, and I have done is develop a different methodology for tracking what's happening with Chinese investment in the United States. While traditional balance of payments measures would look at the net FDI position, that is to say, a Chinese, if a Chinese firm were to invest in the U.S. across border, bring money in from China to do that, and then make a loan back to its parent company in, say, Qingdao, that would reduce the total balance, the value, net value, of that FDI in the United States. Instead, what we're doing is using uh, uh, many, many commercial databases and a lot of hard work of our own to identify and add up each specific deal that counts as a direct investment by a Chinese firm in the U.S. since 2003 and look not at the overall balance of assets and liabilities, but just at the asset side. So what we're interested in is how many, what's the value of assets controlled by Chinese firms in the United States that meets the definition of direct investment, which means a 10 percent stake uh, or greater in a U.S. business. And this is the picture one gets one, when one uses that lens rather than the lagging two-year-old BOP approach to see what's happening with the pattern of Chinese investment here. And using that approach, what we see is that in 2009 and then again in 2010, the value of Chinese-owned direct investment assets in the United States increased 130 percent year on year. And that, that pattern is prevailing so far this year in 2011 as well, with several very large ticket deals that we've already seen since the beginning of the year. So that same extraordinary red line we saw a few slides ago here for the takeoff in China's global official FDI pattern, we're seeing in the United States now in a big way. And as you'll see in the slides, just to follow, when we look at the, the details and the patterns we can perceive, by using our approach, <laughs> it's a hard slog, but by counting up each and every deal, we can see the breakdown in blue and green here between merger and acquisitions and greenfield Chinese investments as well. Let's step in and look at the patterns with a little bit more uh, detail here. Again, which is possible because we're not using a BOP approach. And if you look at Bureau of Economic Analysis's uh, 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 critical uh, BOP information across the street, it won't allow you to see many of the things uh, I'm about to show you. The first is by doing it this way, we can actually see what's happening state to state in the United States. Now, complementing the report that's on the table outside, on our website at the address in red at the bottom right-hand corner there, cim.rhgroup.net, we have put a web app together that allows us to see the evolution over the past eight years of the value of these Chinese corporate invested assets by state 
in the United States. And within each state, you'll be able to look at the industrial mix of which industries it's going into. So uh, to sort of show you what the fast forward looks like, this is the starting point of 2003. Uh, as of 2003, there was only this handful of deals taking place in America that year. We go to 2005, we go to 2007, we go to 2009, and we go to 2010. And we see an extraordinary, extraordinary expansion, still at very low base numbers now. We're talking about, you know, in the low tens of billions of dollars of total stock. But the uh, curve is pointed up in an extremely st steep manner, and it's going to provided in a second uh, we don't mess up the policy context, uh, is going to continue going in that direction. When you take the state-by-state -state numbers that I've just showed you, and please do take a look at uh, the CIM, China Investment Monitor, site uh, later today to play with and see what more uh, information is available there, it adds up to a picture that looks something like this. Uh, almost $3 billion, 20 deals uh, in Texas. New York and Virginia also being at the top of the list. Uh, uh, it's pretty easy to figure out why those states wind up at the top. You find a handful of very big ticket deals. In the case of Texas, we have, for example, the Chesapeake Shale Investments by CNUC last year and at the beginning of this year happened to be uh, Texas domiciled corporate entities that were invested in. In the case of New York, Lenovo's uh, corporate domicile uh, is in New York. Uh, Virginia hosts AES Power. Uh, and so these very big deals will put different states at the top of the ranking just based on a handful of very large uh, investments. Nonetheless, in our research, we find no fewer than 35 American states uh, that have uh, uh, investments, direct investments, uh, by Chinese firms uh, thus far. Uh, other uh, bits of information are available by taking our granular ground-up approach as well. Uh, one of the most interesting is the distribution of Chinese direct investment by industry. There are uh, great misgivings and, and um, curiosity about the industrial distribution of Chinese interest in investing in the United States. Uh, our data, sa data set gives us the opportunity uh, to see what that looks like. And what we find when we look at the distribution is that Chinese investments are not just happening in one or two high technology sectors that would, that would raise flags uh, here in Washington. Uh, about uh, what the Chinese motive and, and objective is. In fact, it's happening across a pretty broad spectrum of different industries. We think, I think we have 16 industries in total that had at least $100 million of Chinese investments. We look at the big four at the top bubbles there, uh, and you get the number of deals along the bottom and the total investment on the side axis. Uh, you see industrial machinery, electronic equipment and components, that's Lenovo, uh, IBM, by the way. Uh, coal, oil, and gas is the Chesapeake Shale uh, investments. Utilities uh, and sanitary services, that's going to be AES. And once we account for Intergen uh, from uh, earlier this year, uh, that'll show up there as well. You see it's the same industries that China's already known to be a major global producer in. So what we see here is Chinese firms trying to move downstream uh, to the more closer to the customer, higher value added activities within the businesses they're already in, uh, by and large. Uh, another field uh, that's in the report, and I think is going to generate some interest, is that by slogging through 250 deals since 2003, along the way of doing that hard work, we're able to code whether they're government companies or not. Now, this is not without controversy. Uh, if a firm has less than 20 percent Chinese government ownership, we call it a private firm. And we certainly call Huawei a private firm. And of course, there's controversy about whether those uh, distinctions are appropriate given the nature of Chinese firms. That's a whole separate issue. It needs two or three more books, Orville, if you want to buy another one. Um, we, can, we can get to work uh, next Monday. Um, but for the moment, we do have, I think, a better look at what the mix is and what's happening so far since 2003 than any other study has provided. And what we see is that in terms of the number of investments, uh, about 70 percent of them or so are not government-related uh, entities investing in the United States. They're firms which are, uh, which are in private hands that are 
uh, privately motivated. Uh, in terms of the total value of investment, there's a heavier weight for government. About two-thirds is government-related. That's not surprising. It's because Chinese government firms tend to be in the capital-intensive uh, sectors of economic activity versus private, which are scrappier and less capital-intensive uh, industries. Um, we also see within that breakdown whether private or government are more inclined to do a, a merger and acquisition versus a greenfield deal as well. And by the way, you know, it is interesting to us in our results that quite a few of these Chinese investments happening in America are greenfield investments. In fact, more than in the global average of investment in the United States, Chinese firms are doing greenfields. Most people think that greenfields are too sophisticated for an emerging economy to handle, that they'll only do m and in, in fact, we see in the case of China, that's uh, not proving to be true, that Chinese firms are, especially when they have partnership and help from American firms uh, and other service providers, uh, 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 able to do uh, greenfields uh, to a greater extent than one would expect uh, in the United States. So the basic patterns in the data, I think, will be very helpful to people trying to sort out what to make um, of this uh, new surge in Chinese uh, investment. Uh, and I have about four minutes left, so let me move quickly to the next question, which is at least as important as what the patterns, the distribution of that investment has so, been so far. And that is, of course, what's the impact of this? So I'm telling you uh, the Chinese are coming. Uh, in fact, they're not only coming, they're already here uh, to a greater extent than most people think. Well, is that good news or is that bad news, right? That's, that's a separate question, isn't it? Um, when we look at impacts through our sort of, okay, careful not to put you to sleep here, uh, macroeconomic uh, analysis and literature, we see that traditionally people observe both economic benefits and some economic downsides to foreign direct investment. Uh, there's more efficiency for American value chains when they're linked into international produc production chains. So in many industries, most in manufacturing, China has some of the most cost efficient uh, production capacity, manufacturing capacity in the world. For that to be more tightly knit together with American R&D capabilities and consumer-facing retail capabilities should be good for American efficiency in general. And when we look at the deals in our data set, that's by and large the case. Uh, there's local effects from foreign direct investment as well. Uh, foreign direct investment can sustain jobs in old companies that would have shut down in the case of an M&A, or create new jobs uh, when greenfield operations are established. And certainly we see that associated with this Chinese investment that's starting to take off in the United States as well. There are things on the risk side too, uh, whether the investing firm is only trying to jump over a tariff boundary that the Commerce Department uh, and ITC have put in place to stop some kind of subsidy. Well, some people would see that as a risk, as a problem. Others would see it as a success uh, by uh, offsetting a, uh, a subsidy going to a Chinese exporter, it forces more of the jobs to be kept in America by moving assets uh, into the American economy. Somewhat complicated issue, but by and large, after culling through all the literature and all the deals that we can see so far, we're pretty comfortable that the balance of economic effects uh, is a win for the United States uh, in terms, of, uh, in terms of, of the economic effects. Looking forward into the future, you know, a lot of people would like us to tell you how many jobs that's going to mean uh, from Chinese investment here. There's really no uh, uh, comfortable way to do that accurately, and it's a dangerous game to play, the jobs game. But we can look back at the experience of other Asian countries in the recent past. And for our purposes right here, just suffice it to say that Japanese affiliate companies in the United States employ nearly 700,000 Americans, uh, as you can see on this chart, uh, and are associated with a lot of exports, almost $5 billion of R&D activity in the U.S. Uh, we don't talk about Japanese investors in Tennessee anymore as though that's somehow an ambiguous story. It's an unmitigated good uh, as, as far as uh, most Americans are concerned. There are some other non-traditional concerns that arise as a result of uh, this Chinese investment. And I won't go into this in great detail now, but we can come back in Q&A. The little tiny red sliver at the top of this chart is investment income from Chinese invested companies into the US back to China. 
you know, the profit from Wanshang Automotive's operations outside Chicago that they wanted to pay back to their headquarters, just as GM wants to pay home profit to the United States from Shanghai, so too will Chinese firms. Because there are so few Chinese firms here yet, that investment income payment back to China is tiny. But look at the investment payment from Chinese treasury debt holdings. <laughs> the rest of the slide, it's a huge number. And uh, of course, the trade surplus as well uh, is a huge net payment from the US to China. As the Chinese investment position, direct investment position here increases, the investment profit in the years ahead will go up as well. And that will add to Tim Geithner's complexities in trying to rebalance the relationship in a way that is seen as win-win. Uh, that's an issue coming down the pike. Finally, then, in terms of analyzing uh, the, uh, the implications here, it's the national security concerns uh, which are going to be overwhelming in most people's minds. We have three quick points that we can come back to uh, uh, later. First, let's remember that there are benefits from investing in one, one another's economies to national security. That by having firms on both sides, relationships building up, we actually add to our, we can add to our security in important ways. Secondly, the traditional risks that we screen for when we screen inward investment from China, uh, critical defense supplies to the U.S. being reduced, a new technology that has military applications being transferred to China and others, those things are screened as carefully and diligently today with Chinese firms as they would be with any other, and it's the same risks with China that we would be concerned with elsewhere. Is China different? You bet China's different in some important regards that need to be discussed. But at the end of the day, none of those differences seem to us to reduce the effectiveness of the CFIUS process in screening for the national security concerns we have. So we have the policy employed by the United States to deal with potential risks from China. We have the politics in America. And those are two very different things. Our bottom line is that the policy America is employing, the CFIUS process, is working as well as we could possibly hope. We can't really envision too many fixes that would make our process fairer to China or more effective at screening out national security risks in the U.S., and we're not aware of national security being impaired by Chinese investment uh, in the recent past. However, the politics in the U.S. are already aggravated and are getting more aggravated every day, even though we're really at a very small initial level of FDI flows into the U.S. So our principal concern, and I'm sure we'll come back to this, is that if we don't address the political misgivings, we're going to step on our own feet and trip here, and the potential for very large inflows, additional inflows in the years ahead could well be lost. Our conclusion, things are booming already. If the Chinese side or anybody else says, hey, how come you're not open to Chinese companies? The answer is, the U.S. is open to Chinese companies. You bet we are, 100 percent year-on-year growth. Uh, the driver for those Chinese companies is profit. Not any, you don't need any other explanation uh, in 99% of cases. Our process is functioning well, but given that there could be one to two trillion dollars of additional global Chinese out outbound investment by 2020, we need to be darn sure that our politics here is going to embrace it and not inadvertently slam the door on it. We have a number of recommendations and conclusions in the study about how to achieve that and make sure we keep the door open. And I look forward to coming back to that in a few minutes, hopefully, and having some conversation about it. Thanks very much. Uh, well, thanks, Dan. Um, before Secretary Locke comes, uh, let's turn to questions. And I do think this uh, report that uh, you've just heard an outline of really does uh, suggest some interesting uh, ways forward for the uh, meetings next week of the Strategic and Economic Dialogue. So uh, we're open to questions from you all. Just raise your hand. Uh, let's start right here. Uh, Derek Scissors Heritage. Hi, Dan. Um, you know, I have like a billion questions, but I suppose people in the audience have some too. My, you know, I agree with your, your general message and I agree with some of your, your policy uh, suggestions. Let me play devil's advocate and say, um, this is six years too late, come on. 2004, the Chinese, buy, uh, I, Lenovo buys IBM's PC unit. You have tremendous interest in Chinese firms and investing in the U.S. They think the door is open. Um, China had a ton of money. You could have said that made the same projection about their outward investment in 2005 that you do now. Um, 
you know, the range would have been a little smaller, that's it. And the U.S. said no. Um, this, this battle's already been lost. And when you're talking about a trillion dollars in outward investment, I, and I hope this is wrong, but, you know, I'm one block away from the Congress, let me tell you what they're going to say. When you're talking about a trillion dollars in outward investment, that's based on what China, the money China has. You know, that's the supply side. The demand side is, forget it, we're not taking this money. And it's acutely true in the U.S. that we've already decided we're not taking that amount of money. Six billion dollars a year, you have five billion last year, we have six let, billion. Let's get an answer because we have a lot of questions Fine, in but very short but time. But they won't take, but the amount of money you're talking about is just not relevant and that story has already been told. Okay. And let me also introduce Tilo Hahnemann who's a co-author of this and so both of you guys feel free to jump in. Let's see, is this on? It is on. Okay, great. Derek, great to see you. Thanks for those points. Um, uh, whether this is six years too late. So. The data made clear that the inflection in the U.S. is only happening over the past two years. So, in fact, that's why I think our approach here is valuable, because it's empirical. And anybody can replicate the methodology and look at the data and how we put it together. When you actually look at the numbers, the inflection didn't happen six years ago. It happened over the past two years. And so we're just at you know, the takeoff point here. Uh, in these uh, flows going forward. So I think there are, uh, and also the context in America, the first time a few big deals hit five or six years ago, I think is somewhat different today than it was uh, five or six years ago. So I, I don't think we're, we're too late to play an important role in American policy thinking on this. Whether a trillion in Chinese outbound investment is a realistic number, well, last year, Tilo, correct me if I'm wrong, I think China finally hit something around the $60 billion out mark, out, outflow for themselves. So in terms of how much will flow out of China, a trillion is probably way low. When we look at the yearly average for China now to 2020, it'll probably be above $100 billion a year flowing out. So the outflow from China number, uh, I think, is, you know, is, is conservative, uh, if anything. In terms of whether the United States is going to take it, let me finish by just making one really important point for us all to remember. The number, the, the share of Chinese deals coming into the U.S., which we have anything to even suggest that we're going to block, is a tiny number, right? Greenfield investments here don't get blocked. They don't get reviewed by CFIUS. CFIUS is only going to screen for national security issues. If the most military-related Chinese company, if Norenko, wants to buy Dairy Queen, there's nothing in U.S. law to stop, to stop them, nor should there be. So our concern is that if uh, these early initial inflows precipitate a, congress a congressional debate about changing U.S. law so that investing while Chinese becomes a crime, then we're going to have a problem, and I'm not sure that keeping Dairy Queen in American hands is necessarily going to serve American interests. Now, now, because we all know the media is sound bitten, I want to, you all to keep your questions short, and Dan and Tilo, keep your answers short so we can get more people in. Uh, right here. Yes. Thank you, Min Xiong with 21st Century Business Herald. Um, I would like to know how do you plan to use this report, especially for those recommendations? Now that you are in Washington, can you tell me, you know, how... Mm, who are who are you planning to meet in the government? And do you have further plan, like how can you convince them to take the recommendations? Right. So um, I think that's a policy question too, Tilo. So Tilo's going to handle the statistical questions. I hope the next one will be statistical because um, there's so much rich meat uh, in the stats. And uh, my answer is that I do think that the patterns emerging right now are patterns nobody really is clear what they are. What I just walked through with you in terms of what industries this is going into, which states are seeing the most money pile up, though that's new information. I think it's by and large not in the public conversation so far. So our first and foremost goal with this study is simply to put uh, reliable information into the debate so that policymakers, politicians, business people can start to work that into their policy planning uh, and, and they're thinking about this issue. So for now, we're just going to be at the table and available to be part of the discussion as it starts to unfold in light of this information. Uh, would it be fair to add, though, that we have a program on Capitol Hill this afternoon, at which we'll be launching this program as well. We'll also be making presentations on the report around the country uh, in New York and in Silicon Valley, uh, for example. So our goal is to bring the report to the attention of policymakers, uh, the business community, 
and others who would be uh, uh, interested in having a good factual basis for understanding the issue. And yet I think it would be fair to say this is not so much a policy question as a sort of a public information uh, political question. So very much that involves the Hill and everybody in America. Uh, right here, David. Thanks. Uh, David Shambaugh, George Washington University. Congratulations, Dan and Thilo, on, on this superb study. I can't wait to digest it in full. Just the teaser presentation uh, really whet my appetite. I'd love to see you go global with this study uh, from America, truly globally, replicate the same kind of database uh, for their global in, uh, investments. But quick question, um, lessons learned. Anytime the Chinese do anything, domestically or externally, they digest the lessons of others, and they reflect sometimes on their own lessons. So my question is, to what extent do you find them digesting the lessons of Japan in the 80s, investing in this country? And to what extent have they digested the lessons of getting their fingers burned uh, with the C. Nook, Blackstone, Morgan Stanley uh, investments of a few years ago? And then if I could ask quickly, M&As, this chart in particular behind you, uh, shows uh, the large um, majority of investments being in M&As, not in greenfields, but in your oral presentation you made a point of noting uh, the large, increasingly large number of greenfield investments. The argument is made that the Chinese invest in M&As because of the weaknesses of their own multinational corporations. They can't operate in the legal environment, the financial environment, et cetera. They just don't, they're not good outside of China, so they partner with foreign companies and acquire them because it offsets their weaknesses. So could you address that question, please? Sure. Let me um, make a comment about the, the Japan experience as seen through Chinese eyes. And then let me let Tilo come back to the M&A versus Greenfield um, question. So you know, what have Chinese firms learned from the Japanese experience? Uh, for starters, let me say that in our database, you know, we're looking at about 243 or, or 250 Chinese instances of investment here. That's not a lot to go on. Uh, it's pretty early days in saying what lessons the Chinese side um, has learned. I think the lesson that they should learn, that they will hear when they ask their, their Chinese uh, friends how it went, was that it took a decade or more for the typical Japanese firm to get its sea legs operating in the U.S. economy. And when we get into great detail in the study, actually, about why now, why Chinese firms are finally making the jump now, it, it doesn't have very much to do with the U.S. keeping anything out. The reason for the Chinese inflection is that they've now got the incentive, as difficult as it is, to come to America and figure out how to do this, and it is difficult for them. So they will struggle, they will be challenged, there are business uh, operating issues here which have no corollary in China whatsoever. Uh, uh, from the Japanese experience, they will learn that that is what will determine success, is learning how to operate in a rule of law, sophisticated marketplace with American consumers right outside the door. Tilo, do you want to make a comment about the Greenfield uh, uh, M&A Max? Maybe uh, first, I've got good news for you. Uh, we're going to have a similar study on uh, Chinese investment in the European Union coming out in um, July, August. And then uh, later this year, we're going to have a book coming out at the Peterson Institute um, <coughs> on China's global outward FDI using the exact same methodology, hopefully in uh, September, October. Uh, with regard to uh, Greenfield and um, uh, M&A, uh, our point was that the share of Chinese, the share of Greenfield in Chinese investment in the U.S. is bigger than uh, um, uh, the share of Greenfield investment in other countries' FDI in the U.S. That was our major point, which is kind of surprising because it's not what we would expect. Okay, uh, more questions. Uh, let's see, right, right back here in the middle. Uh, Todd Thurwachter with STG Incorporated. Uh, of course, when the Japanese came in, it was primarily initially in the 80s developing their um, uh, better distribution systems for their products. And then, of course, the most, the highest profile were the major automotive investments. And that was very definitely in response to concern over, well, certainly profitability long term because they thought they might be excluded from the market with the voluntary export restraints, et cetera. You're saying that the Chinese companies coming in can be completely explained through profitability, but are there no concerns about some type of export restraints at some point? Uh, well, so 
you know, the question of what motivates Chinese firms is really important in this topic because if you don't identify a profit motive explaining why Chinese firms are coming here, well, what's the alternative hypothesis? There must be some political intention that gets people very nervous very quickly. So it's, it's, it's completely essential that we make sense out of the, the microeconomic case, the profit case for Chinese firms doing the hard work of coming here. And when we think about what we would call tariff jumping, which I mentioned in my remarks, yeah, uh, and the Japanese uh, behavior of getting over those VERs by coming and setting up automotive operations here, that's absolutely a profit motive, right? Because a big chunk of profitability is being taken away by the barrier of a tariff or some other kind of trade restraint, right? So I, I think we should bear in mind that that results in firms doing profit-oriented things which is coming to the U.S., even though operating here is more expensive than simply exporting from Japan or, in this case, China. So I would definitely put that on the, the profit motive category. Next question. Uh, let's see. Uh, right in the back there, uh, the last row in the middle. Thank you. Dong Hui Yu with the China Press. My question is for Mr. Daniel. How would you evaluate the impact of the U.S.-China investment treaty that is under negotiation right now? Did you contact with the officials of the both sides to see what are the main obstacles behind the negotiation that the treaty cannot be you know, reached successfully? Thank you. I think you're referring to a bilateral investment treaty, or a BIT, am I correct? Yes. So uh, this is a complicated question. I know that Undersecretary Hormitz spoke to it yesterday uh, in some public remarks. Um, there's a couple issues here, but let me, let me just focus on two things. First, uh, the U.S. is sort of halfway in moving from its old model BIT to a new model BIT. Uh, and there's quite a bit of work to be done internally on the U.S. side before that new template is fully ready to be used uh, in, a, in, a, in a final negotiation uh, with our friends in China, I would say. So uh, I'm not sure that it's correct to say that we're in late stage of negotiation and we're almost done, what's holding things up, this sort of thing. But moreover, I would say that our, our study here, what Orville and Stape uh, have tried to bring into focus, uh, is the larger public policy issue of how the United States is going to react to Chinese investment. A BIT, a bilateral investment treaty, mostly is going to protect investor rights on the ground uh, in the context of business issues and commercial disputes and these kinds of things. That'll benefit American investors in China probably more than it'll benefit Chinese investors in the U.S. because the U.S. already has rule of law and a court system which is pretty fair. I don't recall many foreigners complaining that they don't get a, a fair hearing in U.S. courts compared to American firms. So those are BIT issues by and large. These larger issues of national security, what to think of Huawei or something like that, a BIT will have nothing to do with those kinds of issues, I think. So let's bear that in mind. Way in the back by the door. Thanks, Irv Chapman. I work for Bloomberg Radio. The American Chamber of Commerce in Beijing is in town this week complaining that American companies that want to invest in China are now being told you can take a, a restricted investment and you must turn over all your intellectual property uh, as a precondition. To what extent do you think the Chinese coming to the United States will be looking to develop intellectual property, either their own or from a merger? Uh, that will then enable them to go worldwide and clean the clocks of U.S. competitors? This is a, um, a complicated question. It, 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 it falls under the category of reciprocity, how we should think about this. So there are things that China does which, uh, at the same time it's doing them, China is growing very quickly, right? High GDP growth, and they're a command and control quasi-statal economy. Does that mean the United States should abandon capitalism and employ Chinese planning techniques to decide which industries in America can grow and which should not? I don't think so. I think there are a minority of people here in Washington who think we should throw in the towel on our liberal economics and instead do it the Chinese way. 
right? Uh, on this issue in particular, uh, the U.S. business community, uh, AmCham and the U.S. Chamber not least, uh, are ready to complain more publicly about the Chinese catalog of guidance for foreign direct investors going into China. I agree with AmCham and the U.S. Chamber that China's catalog of guidance has probably outlived uh, its uh, acceptability uh, uh, for the purposes of China's trading partners. But I don't think the US, I don't think the U.S. has anything to learn uh, or should threaten to do anything similar to Chinese firms coming into the United States. Are Chinese firms coming here going to be looking for something that they don't already have, whether it's technology, proximity to our customers, uh, or something else? Absolutely. Of course they are. Uh, should the U.S. government do a regulatory taking and tell whoever owns that company they can't sell it to the Chinese because of what China does uh, in Sichuan? I don't personally think so, but perhaps that needs to be part of the debate. Let me throw a question out to uh, all of you. Uh, if the United States does not get itself in order to maximize its interest in ways that are constructive in bracing this investment, what do you all think the consequences will be? Let me say something about the policy side, and Tilo, jump in if you want to speculate about the specific numbers. But um, uh, I think we're already starting to see uh, a preview of that. Uh, even though we're able to show that the numbers are taking off, the growth of Chinese assets in America is exceptional right now and very positive story, uh, even the relatively small number of deals that have been done so far has been enough to elicit some of the most uh, fear-mongering, complicated firestorm of debate uh, here in Washington of any policy issue in recent years, right? The three-leaf case, a $2 million investment, for example, or CNUC's attempt to buy Unical some years ago. In China, you ask people in China why there aren't more Chinese companies already in the United States, and 95% of them believe it's that CFIUS is blocking them somehow from coming to America. Whereas, of course, in the vast, vast majority of cases, CFIUS isn't even going to have anything to say about Norinco taking over Dairy Queen, uh, to come back to that example. So we're already planting the seeds of mistrust uh, among Chinese entrepreneurs and Chinese firms that are considering the choice between operations in the U.S. and Canada and Germany or someplace else. Uh, and if we don't have an offsetting message, from the top, we recommend, in fact, that both the executive and, and congressional ought to work together to make clear, because it's the case anyway, that we're not going to block most deals. Why don't we get some credit for that and stand up and say very publicly, hey, you're wrong. We're not keeping your firms out. The growth is meteoric, 100 percent a year. And it's going to stay that way. And it's going to stay that way because we're sure that that's good for the United States. State, what are your thoughts on this topic? in terms of sort of larger policy questions? Dan has largely covered it. I, I don't have anything to add. Tilo? Um, I think there's the risk of, of some of those investment flows being diverted to other places that can offer the same um, assets and, and opportunities. We see actually the same inflection happening in Europe, Chinese OFDI to Europe. And um, there's uh, the, the sort of policy and politics environment in Europe is very much different than from the US. So companies such as Huawei, um, have much, much, um, uh, um, they face less uh, uh, obstacles in operating in Europe. So there's, there definitely is the risk of that some of those flows that could be flowing into the U.S. are being diverted away to other places. Let me offer one more thought on this topic just for 30 seconds. So uh, we, uh, in terms of our critique of the U.S. policy regime, toward foreign direct investment and with regard to China in particular, as I mentioned at the beginning, we come out pretty impressed that our system is about as good a system as you could ask for, either from the US perspective or the, uh, or the Chinese perspective for that matter. But there's one exception, uh, which uh, uh, Tilo uh, uh, is fairly expert on, and that is that the United States is coming from an era uh, at w during which it was by far the most competitive, attractive economy in the world. We have more foreign direct investment here than any other economy on the planet does. Uh, there's you know, nobody even really in second place. But it's not the same story today as it was in the 1950s or 60s or even the 1970s. Now, the fact that other countries have active federal efforts to attract and promote inward investment from other economies, and the U.S. 
barely does, we really don't have an effective uh, effort in that regard at all, um, is starting to look more like a disadvantage going forward. Uh, also, it's not just you know fellow OECD investors we're talking about here. We're talking about Chinese firms like Tungjung, remember them, who, which almost made a bid, bid for hum, uh, Hummer, right? These guys had never been out of Sichuan, let alone China. You know, they really did need some more handholding, probably at the national level, to make it possible for them to consider making a major investment in the United States. So while we traditionally haven't gone out and had, you know, an, an American inward investment promotion uh, effort, um, we do now have a small one called Invest in America. Probably need to think about whether we're doing enough in that regard. Uh, Steve, did you? I'm just going to add one personal perspective on the question. When I was ambassador in China, a significant part of my responsibilities was promoting American investment in China. And it was done so in the belief, shared by the business community, that U.S. investments in China were good for the United States and good for China. The same was the case when I was ambassador in Indonesia. I find it very difficult, sitting here in the United States, to somehow throw out that experience and believe that Chinese investment in the United States is somehow not good for China and good for the United States. We were not investing in China in order to subvert China. And China does not, by and large, invest in the United States for reasons other than profits. That's what drives business investments around the world. And if you engage in hanky-panky, you compromise your ability to be a major exporting country. So the report addresses the risks of foreign investment and concludes that we have a pretty good system in place to be sure that we are not being naive. But on the other hand, it also makes the case, I think very forcefully, that Chinese investment in the United States is in our interest and we would be damaging U.S. national interest to adopt policies which cause Chinese investment to flow to other countries where it would prefer and find better profitability here in the United States. Right on the uh, edge there. Thank you. Michael Martin from Congressional Research Service. I'd like to talk a little bit or ask about this encouraging inward FDI. Uh, I scanned over your report and it seemed to be implying that a passive approach of not discouraging inward FDI is insufficient at this time period. I've talked to some Chinese investors interested in investing in the United States and Paraphrase, it's sort of they find it translucent, not opaque mm -hmm. and not transparent, particularly at the state and local level, that they find it very difficult to understand how to make investments when they have to deal with regulatory environments below the federal government level. Do you have any suggestions or ideas on what the federal government in the United States could do to be more proactive in promoting inward FDI, if indeed that is what you are suggesting in your report? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really good question, and I like it because it's driving us down to putting this to work around the specifics of how we would adjust or fine-tune our regimes to better take advantage of our, um, of our American interests with regard to this new flow of money. Um, and uh, for the purposes of a 30-second response or a 60-second response, I'll say that um, the challenges of complying with U.S. local and state law from a business perspective, you know, there, it's just tougher to have rule of law than it is to just go to the local SAIC, as they're, they're called in China, and say, you know, tell me what the priority laws are. I don't want to have to worry about all the laws, but tell me the ones I really have to make sure I comply with. That's not the way it works here. You are liable as a firm to comply with all U.S. law, right? Getting past the inward screening process is just step one of a thousand. Then you have to comply with U.S. law, and that's the real challenge. Uh, and uh, I think you know, uh, government uh, uh, handholders can help people make sure they've got the right advisors, whether they're accountants, law firms, and that kind of stuff. But they can't really make it any easier to file your taxes. It's just going to be tough to do that. At the Fed federal level, though, and we already have actually quite a bit of state and local level promotion of inward FDI. Um, it's pretty impressive uh, what uh, a number of American states are doing to try to attract foreign investment. Some of the biggest challenges for potential foreign investors are actually at the federal level, though. Inability to get a visa, for example. Uh, very basic stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're not, 
let's say we're not discouraging it, and we say we're totally open. The, the policy regimes, as I've said, are about as good as they can get. But look, if you will, in the report at the list of deals that have gotten tangled up in internecine congressional politics. You know, right up to the present moment uh, with Chinese uh, attempts to invest in, you know, prop planes in Minnesota, if I believe it's Minnesota, uh, where Sears is, yeah? Uh, I mean, it's just hard, it's a little hard to say that, yes, the policy process is fine, so you don't have to be concerned. I think the Chinese side will need to be concerned until there is an affirmative statement uh, of openness that comes not just from the executive, but also the other branches of U.S. government which have the potential to gum up the works. It's, it's very interesting to note that the lion's share of the deals that have foundered have not foundered because they've had any regulatory disapproval. They foundered in the fog of political flack where people just give up. And that really is what I think this report is suggesting we need to get straight. Whether the government needs some sort of commission, whether there needs to be a public-private task force. I mean, all of these things we've, we've thought about, we've discussed, and we're not quite sure what we might do. But I think actually something should be done besides just uh, uh, clarifying the situations we've tried to do in this report. Uh, right here. Uh, wait for the uh, microphone, please. Claude Barfield, the American Enterprise Institute. I'd like to follow up on that particular point. Uh, Dan made the point that, and this relates to CFIUS or some alternative to CFIUS. Dan made the point that CFIUS doesn't really cover a lot of these transactions, not Greenfield. But we have had, we have pressures in the other direction. It is, and since I'm in this, this building, it has been widely reported that Secretary Locke intervened to stop Sprint from giving a contract to Huawei. Now, does that lead us in the direction of, well, we could discontinue ex parte interventions. Uh, should we have some coverage of contracts as well as mergers and acquisitions? Should we, should we in terms of, of, to be honest with the Chinese, in terms of wireless equipment or equipment related to the Internet, just say that's off bounds? Uh, where do we go with this, this uh, tough interconnection between the economic and the investment on the one hand and the security on the other? Good question. Yeah, very good question, Claude, as usual. Thank you. Um, first of all, the notion that a sector should be put out of bounds. If I read my morning papers correctly, that's exactly what AmCham and U.S. Chamber said yesterday The China. I know, I know, you're not advocating it. But that's exactly what we, what we, don't, we think they shouldn't be doing. Uh, and indeed, uh, under what the criteria are for CFIUS scrutiny in the U.S., um, we have pointedly chosen not to go with sector blanket prescriptions in the past. Take steel, for example. There's a big, big difference between military grade high tensile carbon steels and rebar that's put into cement to make Walmart walls stronger, right? Um, uh, in telecom, uh, you know, telecom is a very, very broad sector. If you look at the Labor Department's uh, breakdown of all the different employment in the telecom space, you'll find telecommunications engineers. Uh, you'll find a lot of marketing and advertising people that are in the telecom space as well. So we've chosen in the U.S. not to carve out and put off limits whole sectors of the U.S. economy. I think we should continue to look at it case by case. In terms of whether our traditional uh, boundaries for CFIUS disapproval should be altered or changed, I think if we're going to have that conversation, it should start with identifying the three Chinese investments in America that went through, which have been deleterious to American national security. And I'm not sure that anybody can identify uh, what those would be. I'm not sure that I know, after having called through hundreds now uh, of deals since 2003, uh, of deals which, because they were permitted to come in uh, and not, uh, not be mitigated or rejected by CFIUS have undermined the national security of the United States. So I'm not sure what's broken about the system that I would propose to fix, other than the fact that we're liable to scare off a lot of Chinese investors because we're giving them the wrong idea about what our, our national attitude is toward, toward investment from China. Question right here on the side.
uh, well, you know, luckily for us all, Secretary Locke is speaking in a few minutes. So in as much as that's the essence of your question, um, well, I don't know that he's taking questions, actually. Uh, but, uh, Secretary <laughs> Locke, unfortunately, will not be able to take questions. <laughs> but after his remarks, uh, when he arrives, uh, uh, those up here will be available to continue the question and answer period if there's interest. But I do, I do agree with you, Claude, that if we're going to take issue with this, we should do it directly. It's the American way to put it in regulation, to say what our misgivings are, to be upfront about it. And I think the Chinese side, if we were to do that, would not be offended. Because, of course, that's what they do as well. They're very uh, upfront about huge sections of their uh, economy, which they would not permit uh, unmitigated foreign investment into. So if we were to debate doing that, I don't think there'd be reason for anybody to be offended about it. When that, if that debate were to transpire, I would join the debate and say, let's not go that way, as I said earlier. Uh, but um, I would agree with you. Uh, the more upfront, the better. Okay, right on the... Uh, uh, Sasha Gong, Virginia Community College System. And I actually, I have brought uh, dozens of Chinese, Chinese investors to Virginia, and uh, they all have intention to invest. I found out the most difficult part is actually not dealing with our country, America, federal system, but dealing with the city council hmm. and uh, the zoning commission and uh, the investment committee locally. So actually, my, uh, my observation is that, uh, well, our economy is actually more local than national. And uh, every state and every city has their own policies. That's the most difficult part to deal with. And I think I wonder if at federal level we can make a policy and do something to help the Chinese to understand to locate their business at state level. I know many states, like uh, my governor is going to China in a week. Uh, Governor Bob McDonald, I'm very happy with it. And um, so I s I'm thinking, you know, but the Chinese, when they come to US, they use their Chinese mindset to judge the American system. They would go to Washington. Even Washington can't do anything to them. So in that way, I think uh, at that level, uh, more misunderstanding. There are a lot of misunderstanding. I think we can help them by, you know, uh, giving them more education about our system. Thanks. Okay, nice comment. Uh, next question in the back there. Thank you. Uh, Tom Sneeringer, U.S. Steel. And before I make this or ask this question, I want to make sure everyone under understands U.S. Steel has no objection to or could not object really to uh, market-based investment in the United States. Uh, we welcome the competition. But uh, ever since the Bush administration ruled that Chinese subsidies could be subject to countervailing duties if proven through the, the normal process, uh, a number of s Chinese companies have been consistently found in the steel industry especially to be government-owned, government-controlled, and heavily subsidized. My question is, when those specific companies owned by that specific government decide to invest in this country, should there be a special scrutiny as to what's exactly behind it, how it's going to operate, whether it is exporting to the United States the same subsidization regime in under which it makes money in China? And if, if there should be a special scrutiny, what is the forum for asking those questions? Uh, this is a great question. And uh, I think um, the information that we are putting out in this report is going to add to the analysis and debate of that question. It doesn't necessarily get into the legal modalities of how exactly to settle it. I think the, what we've got here is a lot of good contextualization of what the experience that you and your industry is having uh, with this issue. I will say this, that just because a Chinese firm sets up a, uh, a steel uh, production facility in the United States doesn't remove the border barriers that we have. Uh, if there's raw material inputs coming in instead of finished product, then there's still the subsidy code of the United States that can be used to affect the pricing of those uh, of that Chinese product coming into the U.S. that's then moving on to a Chinese finishing uh, facility. So 
And this is a larger point, I think, about our, our findings. There are, there are many, many concerns in the U.S. about the fact that Chinese firms might be government owned, that they might have low-cost loans behind them, uh, that there might be tariff jumping involved. The CFIUS process and their national security screening is not the end of the U.S. opportunity to regulate the operations of Chinese firms in America. It's only the beginning of the process, and it's meant to look for very specific national security threats, not for every possible uh, concern that it would affect American competitiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Nice to see you. We're very fortunate that Secretary of Commerce Gary Locke uh, is able to be with us today. Secretary Locke is an American success story. He was born in Seattle, uh, a wonderful city on the West Coast, for those of you who have been there. Uh, he was educated at Yale. He has a law degree. He served in the Washington State Legislature, and he served eight years as the governor of Washington State. Uh, he's served as Secretary of Commerce for over two years now, uh, and both in Washington and in Washington, D.C., he has been successful in promoting U.S. exports abroad. Uh, there are many firsts associated with Secretary Locke. He's the first Chinese American to serve as the governor of a United States state. He's the first Chinese American to serve as the Secretary of Commerce. And if he is approved by the Senate, uh, he's been nominated by President Obama to be our next ambassador to China, and he will be the first Chinese American to serve as ambassador to China if, again, he is approved by the United States Senate. He has personal experience dealing with the types of issues that we have been discussing here today, and he will provide a broader context for looking at the Chinese investment picture by addressing the U.S.-China economic and commercial relationship. Secretary Locke. Thank you. Okay, I'll just put it down. Uh, right. Sandy will do it there. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Roy, for the introduction. And uh, uh, if I'm confirmed by the Senate, I have uh, uh, many uh, great shoes uh, to try to emulate. Uh, we've had some incredible ambassadors from the United States to China, and you rank among the very, very best. And it's a delight uh, to be here uh, on this program with you. I'm really pleased to be here, especially since uh, next week we're going to be starting the Strategic and Economic Dialogue here in Washington, D.C., I'm really pleased to be part of these uh, proceedings to, uh, in which uh, this report on maximizing the benefits of Chinese foreign direct investment uh, is, uh, uh, is being discussed. Uh, for decades, uh, the United States has welcomed foreign investment in our shores. With a market-based economy supported by a fair and transparent legal system, the most productive and best educated workers in the world, and vast natural resources. This openness has made the United States the world's largest destination for foreign direct investment. And the Obama administration wants to keep the United States as the world's premier destination for the ideas, the innovations, and indeed the capital of foreigners. That's why the President's 2012 budget uh, aims to make such significant investments in education, innovation, and infrastructure. We've simply got to maintain these building blocks of a vibrant economy, to keep attracting foreign and domestic investment. Because wherever you see foreign direct investment in American communities, you'll see businesses and jobs being created and supported. Foreign-owned companies employ some 5 million American workers in every single one of our 50 states. And increasingly, we're seeing more investment coming from China. Uh, Commerce's Bureau of Economic Analysis reports that investors from China have a total value of foreign direct investment in the United States of about $2.3 billion. And the report released today shows that Chinese foreign direct investment to America is doubling and has doubled in each of the last two years. Chinese investors now have investments in at least 35 of our 50 states across dozens of industries. And the big question we're really getting at today is pretty straightforward. Is more Chinese foreign direct investment a good thing? The answer is yes. It's a good thing for American workers, and it's a good thing for American businesses. And that's why today there are few American industries where the Chinese or other foreign investors are restricted from investing in. 
Unfortunately, that is not the case for American companies operating in China, where they are frequently shut out of entire industries, or they're forced to give up proprietary information as a condition of operating in China. This imbalance of opportunity is a major barrier to continued improvement of the U.S. and China's commercial <coughs> relationship. And it is part of a broader trend of China recently narrowing its commercial environment after a very long and fruitful period of opening up. Today I want to talk a little bit more about America's concerns and about how we can move past them to take our trading relationship to the next level. China's turn toward economic openness over the past few years is perhaps the chief reason why it has been able to bring hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and into a thriving middle class. This openness extended to foreign direct investment in many industries where China saw growth potential. And this openness helped put Chinese people to work. It helped transfer tremendous know-how to Chinese companies and gave those companies enormous capacity to become major manufacturers and major exporters. China's policies have also provided opportunities for foreign investors to enjoy substantial revenues from their China operations. It's been a mutually beneficial relationship. But we could be at a turning point in our economic partnership, a partnership defined less by China making and U.S. consumers taking, and more by empowered Chinese consumers buying more goods and services made in America, a partnership marked by Chinese and American innovators working side by side to develop breakthrough technologies. <coughs> Just look at what's happening with General Electric, which has formed a joint venture with China's Xinhua Energy Company to advance cleaner coal technology solutions for industrial chemicals, fuels, and power generation. Or look at the agreement that was signed earlier this year to establish a U.S.-China public-private partnership on health care. This partnership will draw its strength from U.S. and Chinese companies working together to help China achieve its goal of improving health care for its people. And it will open new export markets for U.S. companies that are world leaders in medical devices and in healthcare innovation. These are but a few examples of our country's best minds working together on breakthrough technologies that could open up hundreds of billions of dollars in new commercial opportunities in both China and the United States. Opportunities that could create millions of good family wage jobs in both countries. Unfortunately, for every success story, there remains far too many stories of American and other foreign companies being prevented from investing or operating freely in the Chinese marketplace. In my travels across the United States, I continue to hear stories of exasperation from American business leaders concerned about the commercial environment in China. These concerns are shared by businesses all around the world. These are not just American concerns, but international concerns. And the most frequent complaints revolve around lax intellectual property protection, lack of predictability and openness in government decision making, and a series of policies that unfairly discriminate against foreign companies operating in China. When it comes to market access problems for foreign companies, the issues may be different but the, fundament, the, but the fundamental problem often boils down to the distance between promises of China's government and its actions. Perhaps an agreement is made in Beijing, but is never implemented. Or perhaps a well-written law or regulation at, the, or there's a well-written law or regulation at the national level, but there's lax enforcement at the provincial or local level. Whatever the case, we often don't see real results on the ground. Let me just cite a few examples. First, look at the issue of transparency, where U.S. companies find that laws and regulations are often developed or changed unpredictably without notice or the opportunity for public input. In 2008, China pledged to institute a 30-day public comment period for all proposed trade and economic-related regulations. But a recent U.S.-China Business Council report found that over the last year, less than 3% of proposed regulatory measures had been published as promised. Or look at the issue of intellectual property. 
Chinese leaders have condemned intellectual property theft in the strongest terms, and we've seen central government laws and regulations written or amended to reflect that sentiment. But American and other foreign companies in industries ranging from pharmaceuticals and biotechnology to entertainment still lose billions of dollars every year in China from counterfeiting and IP theft. To cite just one example, the American Business Software Alliance estimates that nearly 80% of the software used in China is counterfeit. This lack of transparency and lack of intellectual property protections all indirectly make it less appealing for foreign companies to invest in China. But China has also pursued policies that make investment by foreign companies especially challenging, such as in indigenous innovation policies that shut out foreign companies entirely out of some industries, or unacceptable transfer, uh, technology transfer pro provisions as conditions of even operating in China. The Chinese, uh, for example, just released a draft of its foreign investment catalog, the first revision since 2007. The Chinese pledged at the SNED two years ago and at last year's Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade that they would lift prohibitions in the revised catalog on many industries in which U.S. firms are world leaders and really have much to offer the people and the government of China. Well, the new foreign investment catalog falls short of that promise. China has also recently, recently announced a new review system to vet foreign investments based on national security parameters that are, quite frankly, very vague. Even more troubling, the review system allows competitors and others outside of the Chinese government to influence the process by proposing to the Chinese authorities that a particular transaction be reviewed. We're not aware of any other country which allows this potentially abusive element in their foreign direct investment reviews. It's also worth noting that China did not publish for public comment the measure establishing this system, and perhaps some of these and other shortcomings could have been avoided had China done so. All these recent moves by China result in its economy becoming less competitive and less welcoming to foreign direct investment. The Obama un administration understands that making progress on these issues can be difficult, especially when China is faced with so many challenges, and especially when China has millions of people coming in from the countryside looking for work. It isn't necessarily an easy decision to close down a factory producing counterfeit goods when that factory is producing badly needed jobs for the people of China. It can be tempting to write regulations in a way that tilts the competitive playing field in favor of domestic companies. But these policies cannot continue if the United States and China want to capture the full promise of our commercial relationship. The international community has every right to seek more meaningful commitment and progress from China in implementing the market opening policies that it agreed to when it joined the WTO in 2001. The irony is that reforms that are being resisted today could ultimately bring huge benefits to the people of China and could actually help the Chinese leader achieve their goals of modernization. China's economy is increasingly moving up the global economic value chain where growth is created not just by the power of the country's industrial might, but also by the power of its people's ideas and innovations and inventions. In the long run, economies with poor intellectual property protections and restrictive conditions on foreign investment will lose out on generating great new ideas and technologies and even jobs. And they'll lose out on the jobs that come with producing these new products, jobs that are critical to expanding a middle class. Over time, if innovators, inventors feel that their great ideas, their inventions will be stolen or discriminated against, one of two things will happen. They'll either stop inventing or they'll decide to create and sell their inventions elsewhere. Ultimately, all that the United States seeks is a level playing field for its companies where the cost and quality of their products determine whether or not they get business. Helping to promote market reforms in China and opening up markets for American companies has been a primary focus of mine in my years as Secretary of Commerce. 
and if the Senate grants me the privilege of serving as our next ambassador to China, it will continue to be a strong focus of mine. Significant challenges lie ahead. For market reforms to continue, it will take constant vigilance and engagement, not just from the United States, but from all countries and businesses around the world that benefit from rules-based trading, and also from the Chinese business and government leaders who themselves have a stake in ensuring that China is friendly to global innovation and international competition. There are real frustrations within the administration and among <coughs> businesses and congressional leaders about the commercial environment in China. And the United States will, of course, always continue to use every a tool at its disposal to ensure that China makes good on its commitments. But the fact is, we've used bilateral discussions with China to successfully resolve major, major trade disputes in the past. And that's why next week's SNED, as well as our annual Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade Deliberations, are so important. Constructive change requires dialogue. We can't forget that, especially in light of how far and how quickly China has progressed. In front of us is the opportunity for China and the United States to lead the world economy in the early 21st century, to create a new foundation for sustainable growth for years to come. We can't tell exactly what that future will look like. But we can be certain that it will be a better future if both the Chinese and American governments pursue cooperation over confrontation in the economic sphere. Cooperation that will put millions of both of our peoples to work. Cooperation that will develop technologies to solve some of the most pressing environmental, economic, and social challenges facing the world today. That's the great opportunity before the United States and China. We simply have to seize it. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we're happy to, uh, Dan, Tilo, to uh, continue on with a few questions uh, for those of you who'd like to, for those of you who need to go. Uh, you certainly have our permission, but Dan and Tilo, come on up, and, and uh, uh, if there's any other one else that wants to pose a question, please feel free. Right here. Uh, let's see, where are our microphones? Um, we have a question, right? Uh, this gentleman here. Yeah, there comes the mic. Please. Uh, it should be. Uh. My name is Francis Schur. If we could have, uh, have the room uh, quiet, please, we'd appreciate it. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that uh, there's a question, there's, there's a condition that hasn't been addressed that it's very touchy in things concerning the cultural and basically the racial overtones between the relationship between the United States and China. And is there any reason why nobody wants to address that? Uh, either of you have thoughts? I mean, I, uh, I think it's undeniable that in the relations between the U.S. and China uh, over the last 150 years, there's always been a uh, an ele element of us and them, which has a certain racial overtone. But I do think, you know, we've made immense progress uh, of late. Uh, there's still a very mixed record of attraction and repulsion between the two uh, countries and our different political systems, never mind our, our different racial profiles. But uh, I don't foresee, I mean, America is the great melting pot, and it's not as if Americans are unacquainted with Asians or Chinese. So I do think that we're, we've come a long, long way on this question. I don't know if you have any further comments, uh, you two. No, I don't. All right, uh, next question. Yes, right here. Uh, Molly Frost from George Washington University. This has been just an excellent, excellent program. Thank you. Um, can you tell us something more about greenfield investments? What are they? Where are they? 
Um, so there's there's a basic distinction between uh, in, in in foreign direct investment between greenfield projects and mergers and acquisitions. Mergers and acquisitions are um, if a Chinese company buys an existing company in the U.S. or any existing assets, uh, greenfield investments um, are building companies from scratch. So new facilities, new factories, building a retail store, building building a, a plant, um, and, and that's the basic distinction that people usually draw between those types of investment. It's not an investment. No, it's not. No, no. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, right over here. <clears throat> Peter Geib from Minnesota State University. Uh, really <coughs> interested in anything you, uh, you guys have to say about opportunities for small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, any, anything you can elaborate in terms of the nuts and bolts of all of that? Maybe it's uh, too far afield for you, but uh, there have been some comments here that I found particularly interesting, such as the comment made by our uh, friend from uh, Virginia, uh, who mentioned that the biggest problems for uh, uh, foreign direct investment coming in from China were at the local and state level, I, I, and how that might impact uh, small, medium-sized enterprise, but also any strategies you might have for small, medium-sized enterprise to take advantage of uh, what is going on with this, uh, uh, with this new, uh, uh, with all these new developments? Uh, so I presume we're, we're focusing here on American SMEs. Yeah. yeah? We, we could actually turn it around and look at it both ways, right? We look at the average deal size and our deals and how that's changing over time. So, you know, in fact, there are a lot of smaller, and by smaller we mean, you know, a few million dollars or $10 million investments taking place in the United States, uh, where the U.S. seller is an SMA and the Chinese buyer is an SMA, for example. Just the, right before we went to press, we had to decide whether to include in our data set the purchase of a vineyard in Marin County uh, by a Chinese winemaking company from Hebei, for example. Those are SMEs. Um, so I think uh, what we can say from our data uh, in terms of the assets being bought in the United States is that certainly they're not only big, giant corporate monsters that we're talking about here. That you know, probably, probably the majority of the uh, businesses targeted in the United States are going to be you know, firms uh, smaller than uh, $25 million, I would say. So, I mean, in the U.S., that's very much a smaller firm or a medium-sized firm anyway. Um, so they're definitely going to be part of the part of the the, the, the the winner side from having more bidders out there looking at their businesses and offering them uh, a good price tag uh, for their companies if they're in the market to sell their businesses. I would also say, of course, that most SMEs in the United States are part of somebody else's value chain. And it's, it's a funny thing. Uh, my colleague, Joe Wang, who's at the USITC, he and I published a book two weeks ago on a different topic. He's the expert on the fact that while SMEs don't show up in U.S. trade statistics as big exporters, they are absolutely critical part of U.S. exporting value chains. So it might be Apple shipping a final product to Latin America uh, and showing up as Cupertino, California's export. But there are you know, literally hundreds, if not thousands, of SME American companies uh, that are part of Apple's value chain here that benefit from their global position. And likewise, U.S. firms that are going to be part of a Chinese value chain uh, are, going to, uh, are going to benefit as a result as well. I think we have time for one more question right uh, here. Thank you. I'm Jeannie Nguyen from Voice of Vietnamese Americans. We are talking about bringing China here to the U.S so that we can use the market in China. We also are talking about um, progressing with the TPP so that we open up the market in Southeast Asia and also Asia market and in the Pacific. <coughs> so would you give us the link uh, for a Chinese company here with the market in the Pacific Ocean? Would they be, would they be taking advantage of us? Hmm. Well, let me offer one, one thought on that. I don't know if it will fully satisfy your curiosity uh, in the question, but it will touch on something that is important. For the, 
you know, for the vast, vast majority of businesses, whether they are American businesses or Chinese businesses that are involved in the global marketplace today. Uh, it's a series of hard management decisions to figure out the ideal place to put your production facilities and your research and development facilities and your customer relations facilities. Uh, whether it's Trans-Pacific Partnership trade agreement that would reduce some trade and investment uh, barriers among a set of Pacific bordering nations, uh, or it is providing greater clarity that the United States is open and encouraging to investment from China and other economies, it's the same bottom line. It's removing political uncertainties that confront businesses, small, medium, and large, uh, worldwide, so that what makes good business sense, what makes them more competitive or less competitive, drives their decision to invest in North Carolina uh, or uh, Virginia uh, or Michigan or Canada or anywhere else, rather than having to worry about whether a politician, whether in Beijing or in Washington, D.C., is going to stand up and make a political hay, if you will, um, out of their potential business investments. Before we end, let me just note that I think um, Secretary Locke made a lot of interesting points about the problems of investing in China. Uh, our report really focuses on China's problems of investing in America. And I think it would be fair to say that these two should be relatively discrete worlds. Because if you start uh, conditioning the openness of the American market on the openness of other markets, well, that's a very slippery slope. And it's a very quick recipe for a lot of, uh, uh, I think, uh, not only protectionist, but tit for tat kinds of behavior. I think what the United States is challenged to do here is to take its traditionally very open market and make sure that it's abundantly clear that it is open in the same way for Chinese as it is for other, other uh, investors, with the caveat that there are national security questions. Now, how do Americans invest in China and how the Chinese deport themselves in relation to these investments? It seems to me that is quite a different question, a very legitimate one, but a different question. Well, listen, thank you, Dan, thank you, Tilo, and thank all of you uh, for coming. <clears throat>